Welcome to this course. This is Health and Safety Tutorial on Construction Safety. Um, we're Samara United. My name is Jonathan Scopes. So let's talk about construction safety. What we're going to try and cover the, in this period is construction site challenges. The site is never the same. It, we might be on a site for six months or two years, but after that we move to a new site. If we're building something, it changes as we build it. We need to control those hazards. The work environment is usually outdoors. We work in the sun, we work in the rain, we work when the wind blows. Very often there's no electricity on site, so we have to bring power to site. We'll think about site logistics. We need to have toilets from day one. How can you ask people to work on a site if there are no toilets for them to use? We'll think about manual handling, how to pick things up or push things or pull things tools and equipment, the things that we use with our hands. Then we'll think about controlling work and permits, how to assess risk, health risks. Then we'll look at work at height because work at height is the big killer of people on construction sites. Confined spaces and then finally personal protective equipment. So site challenges. The sites keep moving. And because the sites move, the people who work on the sites move with them. They might stay in temporary accommodation. It changes. You start with a site, and maybe first you have to demolish an old building, then you have to dig a hole, and then you come up, and it moves. And as you make progress, the site changes. It's not like a factory, which is production, more or less continuous, the same day in, day out. We will have heavy equipment. And some of the construction equipment is really big and robust. And if you get hit by one of those machines, you're finished. Or your car gets hit by the really, really big machines, you're also finished. Then we have the sun, the rain, not so much in Oman, but we do get rain. Um, the heat, in the UK we get the cold, and sandstorms, and so on. But the weather's important. And if we're outside, we're in that weather doing our work. The services are not connected, so we may have no power, we may have no sewers, we may have no water. We need to provide those and think about them as um, people who manage safety. We need to have those things ready from day one. And then there are hidden services, things like drains, sewers, electric cables, fiber optics. Fiber optics may not be dangerous to hit, but they're very expensive. So all these things have to be in our minds as we think about construction challenges. Each person or each company involved in a construction project has duties and responsibilities. The client needs to set the standard and say, we're going to have a safe site. And then they have to provide information so that the people know what to expect on this site. This site may have nothing at all unusual or it may have a buried electric cable, or an overhead electric cable, or a school next to it where lots of kids come out. These things the client has to say. The designer needs to design the structure, the building, whatever, so that it is safe to build, safe to operate, safe to maintain, and eventually safe to demolish. But he should have a plan in his head how something can be built, operated, maintained, and demolished safely before we ask someone to build it. The contractor's role, keep everybody safe on site. Once the site is handed over to the contractor, they're responsible for safety. And they need to manage their team, the client visitors, subcontractors, the authorities visiting, all these people are the contractors to manage. And workers. The workers have duties to look after themselves, look after their colleagues, think about safety, cooperate and discuss with their employer about safety. And workers have a right also to refuse to do something if they consider it unsafe. And that's enshrined in law and in Oman it's MD 286-2008. The work environment. Think about what you need to do your work. You need a toilet. If you have a toilet, you need someone to wash your hands. If you have a toilet, you need someone 
or a, a, a cleaning regime at least. You need ventilation, good lighting, non-slip floor. And these are required from day one on a construction site. You can't ask people to work for three months on a site and not provide toilets. They need somewhere to wash. So if they come to work in home clothes and work in um, company clothes, they need somewhere to change. They need somewhere to eat their food. Or if you're providing the mess, you're providing the food. But you need to have somewhere to do that. So if it's a place where you prov provide a canteen, maybe you have to provide a kettle, a microwave, a fridge, that kind of thing. And a place for them to sit. In Oman, it will be air conditioned. In the UK, it will be heated. The chairs need, or the bench needs to have a back support because when they're resting, they need the back support. So think about the welfare. And ask yourself this question. Would I be willing to use those toilets? Would I be happy to change in that room? Am I happy to eat in the canteen? And if you are, they're probably okay. Vehicle movements. We have a picture here of a busy site. Common causes of accidents are people driving to work. So we have accidents on the way. Perhaps because they're using a phone, they shouldn't be. Even a hands-free phone can distract you. Perhaps the driver's tired. Many workers have their home in one place and they might drive 200 miles to, for the week's work, stay there five nights, and then drive back again. When they're driving to work, they can be fatigued. Your truck driver's making deliveries. Think about how long their journeys are and keep, them, keep the journey times down, manage them well. Another common cause is poor maintenance. You can be the best driver in the world, but if the brakes fail, you're in trouble. We need the vehicles maintained, the tires, the brakes, and so on. Then we have environment. So they're driving, and the rain comes down heavily. We need to have a plan. Maybe the plan is to park up on the side and wait. Or we have a sandstorm. We can see nothing. Again, maybe park up and wait. Or in extreme heat, we have to think about air conditioning, and then for all journeys, breaks and rest periods. So the drivers are fresh when they're driving and can drive safely. Accidents happen when we're loading vehicles and unloading. We can overload vehicles. We can accidentally, with a forklift, push other material off the truck. Um, many kinds of accidents. And then maneuvering, particularly reversing. And when a truck is reversing, the driver can only see what's in his mirrors. And if you're not in his mirror, as he backs up, he can't see you, and you could be hit. So you need to think, can I manage my sight so that trucks do not have to reverse? One way only. Temporary works. Temporary works are anything that you need to have in place to build whatever you're building, but are not part of the permanent works. So for example, I excavate a hole to make the foundations in. That hole is a temporary works. We have to think about how the sides are held up, maybe with sheet piles, or maybe by cutting the ground at a slope, but that's a temporary work. Maybe I need a crane to lift things up. That crane is a temporary work. The foundations for the crane are a temporary work. The electric power cable, usually a three-phase power, big cable, is a temporary work. And pouring concrete, the wet concrete doesn't hold itself up, it needs form work. The form work and the supports are all part of temporary works, and we need them. And at the end of the day, we will remove them and leave the building or the structure complete. But you need to put good people on temporary works, good engineers, because they're challenges, they're difficult, and many, many times they've not been thought about properly. The movement of people. We have to have people moving, otherwise nothing gets done. If we're moving, we can slip on the floor. We can trip on rubbish that we've left lying around. So keep the site tidy. People can fall when they get to the edge of a building and there's no bar barrier around the edge. They can fall from height. And you can fall from height at ground level down into a manhole. You can have collisions between moving vehicles and you can have collisions with vehicles and people particularly, as I said, reversing vehicles. And you can be struck by things getting blown off a building under construction, or things falling off, or even, dare I say, things being thrown down, like rubbish being thrown down. 
if it's not managed properly. So we need to think about our people. How are they going to move safely? If they come out of the canteen and that's part, they have to cross a, a construction road, how are you going to manage that? There are many ways you can do it, but you need to have a plan for people to cross those roads safely. Manual handling. Manual handling is a common cause of injury. So not fatalities, usually, but injuries. And we can do an assessment. And we can think about the task. How is it going to be done? Do I have to stretch or bend? Do I have to, can I carry it close to me? Or do I have to twist? We shouldn't twist, we should turn with our feet. But the task, do I do many repetitions a day, the same thing hundreds of times? Or is it one thing? Or, which is heavy, or is it 10 times a day? That's the task, so think about the task. Then think about the individual who's going to do it. Is he young or old, or is she young or old? Are they strong or weak? Do they have a medical condition that makes them unsuitable? If a woman is involved, is she pregnant or likely to be pregnant? These things affect how much someone can lift. Then we think of the load. What's the load look like? How is it packaged? Does it have handles? Is it too big to get my arms around? Has it got sharp edges? This sort of thing. How heavy is it? And lastly, we think about the environment. Is the floor level? Is the ground level? Are there slopes? Are there steps? Is it hot? Is it humid? If you get hot and humid, your hands can be slippery with sweat. So we need to think. And then all these things will be part of our assessment. Is it reasonable for me to ask one person to lift this, or should I ask two? Tools and equipment. We use tools. We can't do anything really without tools. And tools can be as simple as a pair of scissors, or a screwdriver, or a hammer. And you can injure yourself, or someone can injure themselves with a hammer, you can bang your thumb, you can bang the nail and the nail can jump out. Um, the handle may be cracked and you uh, injure your hand. Well, a power drill, power tools, they have maybe electricity. The one in the picture is a, is a power drill on the, on the um, right hand side. But, where's the cable? On a construction site, cables are a problem. You need to manage those cables, otherwise people will tread on them, they'll get damaged, and they can get shocks. Better if you can change from a, a, a cable-powered tool to a battery-powered tool. A battery has a lower voltage, maybe that cable on site is um, 110 volts, and your battery is 12 volts. And if you have the battery, there's no cables to manage. You've resolved a problem, and that's a great thing to do. And with batteries, you can change by one, ba one drill and two batteries and change over at lunchtime and just have one charging and one, on, one off. And um, the drill will last the whole day on two batteries. Permits to work. Permits to work are for where we have a high risk activity, something with a high potential to cause hazards. So for example, if we have to do some grinding, which produces sparks, or some welding, which heats and produces sparks, then we need to have a system and the system will say, this is how we're going to manage that risk. We might have a fire extinguisher, or we might have um, a fire blanket, or we might have someone looking out for fires, or we might have a system that says, this is dangerous, only that person may do it, and then only at this particular time of day, and only on this date, and that I give permission for him to do it. And if I sign and give permission, if something goes wrong, I gave permission and I'm in trouble. So, safe energy isolation. So if we're going to ask somebody to work on a piece of equipment, we need to be sure that equipment's not going to move or operate or start while the person is in there with his hands doing the job of maintenance. So we can have what's called a lockout tagout system. And this is a system where you put a padlock on and a, and a label, like in that picture, and while the padlock's there, because of where the padlock is, you cannot operate the machine. You've isolated, let's say, the electricity, or you've isolated the flow of the liquid by tagging, locking and tagging the valve. And now it's safe. 
and the person doing the work also puts a padlock on. So now you've got a padlock on and the key is in my pocket. And then I know no one's going to start it because the key is with me. And that's what tag out's all about. Protecting the person doing the job. Hidden electrical services. We have cables in lots of places. On the left hand side you see a man using a CAT scan and it makes a noise, a steady noise, as it searches for cables. And then when it finds a cable, it makes a sudden change of noise. It might go from and you know there's a cable there. And because you know, you can then take precautions. You can carefully excavate by hand to find the cable. If you don't, you're in danger of what's happening in the middle picture, where somebody was excavating using a jackhammer, he struck the cable, it's an 11 kV cable, and he was killed. And the black that you see on the um, jackhammer was part of the steel tip, and because of the electric arc, it melted and he was burnt by steel gas. The gas obviously solidified quickly. Or even drilling a hole in a wall, there may be a cable in there, and unless you scan for it, you don't know. So first check the drawings, the site drawings, then ask the um, electricity supply company, are there any cables here? And then scan for them anyway. Be cautious looking for cables and hidden services. Overhead cables you can see. But the thing about overhead cables is high voltage cables, the electricity can jump, it can arc, and it can arc quite a long way. In ideal conditions, a 440 kV cable can send an arc 18 meters, and that's a long way. It'd have to be humid, it'd have to be high, very high voltage, but it can happen. So you need to separate your work from those cables, and you can do it by produce, putting fences there or goalposts, so if your vehicle can go under the goalpost, it's got a safe distance to the cable. But think about power cables, they're dangerous. Fires. Now, common causes of fires on workplaces are, during construction are because we've got damaged cables, so try to avoid cables. Because we have rubbish accumulated, so try and keep your place tidy. Because of smoking, have a no smoking policy and have a smoking area. In the UK we have heaters, and those can be in the, in the site cabins. You can have hazardous materials that are flammable, like your diesel store or your petrol store, and paints, so you need to store those and lock them and have it ventilated. Arson. Arson means where somebody starts the fire on purpose, for some reason. They're maybe slightly un un disturbed mentally. But they start the fire and then you have the problem. And then hot work activities like welding, cutting, grinding, these can also provide the spark that starts the fire. And the time you're most vulnerable in, if you're constructing a building is when you've nearly completed and you've, 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 you're, you're nearly there but you haven't switched on and activated the fire alarm system yet. That's not been commissioned. And so you've got a whole building with carpets maybe and so on that can all burn and no protection. And that's the time to think really carefully about fire control. This slide is so we talk about chemicals. Now you can find out about chemicals and what, what's in them and how to manage them from the safety data sheet, sheet. So the supplier should give you that safety data sheet. If he doesn't, look at the container and the container will give you the chemical name. Google that name and find the safety data sheet and read about it. And the safety data sheet will tell you things like how it's packaged, what it looks like, how to store it, how to manage spills, what happens if you get it on you, what happens if you breathe it or ingest it. But remember when you're thinking about these chemicals that the chemical can get into us sometimes through our skin, sometimes we can breathe it, and sometimes we can eat it because I got some on my hands and didn't wash my hands before I ate my food. So always think about the different ways in when you're thinking about a chemical risk assessment. Think about it because it may come in two ways or even three ways. Right, vibration. Vibration was split into two parts. One is whole body vibration. I'm on a vehicle and it's on a bad road. My whole body is being vibrated. And 
and been subjected to vibration and it will eventually lead to um, me mental confusion or back pain or feeling sick. Or hand arm vibration is where I'm using a tool with my, and the vibration is coming through my hands and my, my arm and you can damage your hands and arms and joints badly. And the, in the long term, if you expose someone to vibration for a long term, then they're going to be in trouble with um, losing muscle control. Stress. We can all be stressed by work. But you can make stress worse for somebody by adding heat. So if they're stressed with their job and it's hot, it will be worse. Or if it's humid, it will be worse. Or if there's noise, it will be worse. So think about your people and the stress that they have. And if they're in a hot, humid, noisy place, you need to think very carefully about how you're going to manage their workload. Working at height, I mentioned this because it's the number one cause of fatalities in construction. So scaffolds, a common way of going, providing work access so people can get up and do the job that you want them to do. But scaffolds need to be built by someone who knows what they're doing and they need to be designed by someone who knows what they're doing. So if the scaffold is just for people to walk on with a tin of paint, that will be one scaffold. But if you're going to load blocks of concrete or bricks, heavy materials, onto the scaffold, it needs to be a different design, obviously. Then the scaffold needs to be checked usually every week and on the right hand side of the up picture you see a scaff, a scaff tag we call it. So that's a tag that says a competent person checked it on this date and if it's within a week you can go on it. And if it's more than a week don't go on the scaffold, get them to check it. Because if you look at the bottom picture there's a scaffold that's been blown over and that's a problem. And here's some other ways of getting up to thing, up people up to the place where they're going to do the work. So they can, we call them noobs, mobile elevated working platforms. So you have scissor lifts, brooms, cherry pickers, and as long as the person operating them knows what they're doing and the ground is reasonably flat and stable, they're a great way to get people up and down. Confined space. Confined space is where someone has to go into a small place like a chamber or a tank or a vat or a trench or a sewer, anything like that, any place like that. And because it's confined, it's more difficult to work there because the person may get injured down there and how are you going to get them out? Or the atmosphere in there, the, the air in there may not be clean air. It might be sewer air full of methane so the person can't breathe it. Or something else, it might be a, a, a contaminated source of air. So we need to manage confined spaces and confined spaces need a permit to work and someone's going to have to check and have a rescue plan in place before the man or the person goes down into the confined space. But we need to have a plan in place to get them out safely because if the man collapses at the bottom of the manhole I cannot go down there and carry him back up because I will have to breathe and maybe it's the gas down there that killed him. And there are sad stories about one person collapsing and another person thinking they would rescue him and collapsing as well. And the last slide for things to think about are personal protective equipment. Now on a hierarchy of risk control, this is the bottom of the list. We'd like to eliminate or reduce or substitute or have administrative controls first. But if we have to have PPE, and we usually do, then let's have quality PPE that PPE comes with a problem. If it goes wrong, it fails to danger. So if I have a mask on, but the mask doesn't fit because my face is the wrong shape, it fails to danger, I breathe the gas. If I'm wearing goggles and they're the wrong sort, they may shatter if something flies towards my eyes. If I'm wearing boots and the boots don't have the, the sole plate to stop the nails coming through and I tread on the nail, it will fail to danger. And then PPE also needs things like maintenance, cleaning, replacing. These are reasons why PPE needs to be managed correctly. And lastly, I'd like to say, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Thank you.